Hi, everybody. Um, I want to acknowledge the ancestors and unceded territories of the Okanagan people where I currently work and live. And I have raised my sons here, so we glitch to them. Um, this is a huge question. <laughs> so I'm going, I uh, know that I cannot even begin to do justice to it in uh, two or three minutes. Uh, but I will share some thoughts um, about that question. So thank you for the opportunity. And in, in my response, I'm going to refer to the Indigenous Early Learning and Child Care Framework um, <clears throat> and talk about it. Um, and I really want to let folks know that I am speaking from my own experience and my own education. I am not representing the views of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples in my remarks, but rather my own lived experience. As an Indigenous woman and mother of three sons, I am here to tell you that the future of Indigenous nationhood rests upon women um, caring for their children. And for many of us, uh, that means having access to childcare so that we can be both leaders and raise up future leaders in our families, our communities, and our nations. I often dream and contemplate about a better world for our children, as I know many of you do. In my world, that honors diversity and celebrates its richness, especially um, during these trying times. And I know that Monica uh, spoke of this early on and for many reasons. And in this, children are not passive recipients of this dream. Rather, it is through them that this better world will be achieved. I think it's first important to recognize that the Indigenous Early Learning and Child Care Framework is the first of its kind for First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples in Canada. There has never been such a framework for our children and our families. The ELCC framework, the IELCC framework, pardon me, uh, rests upon a distinction-based approach that recognizes Indigenous self-determination. What we mean when we talk about distinction-based approach is an approach that ensures the rights, interests, and circumstances of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis nations are acknowledged, affirmed, and implemented. The IELCC framework supports specific First Nations, Inuit, and Métis frameworks. So there's three of them um, that constitute um, the overall IELCC framework. So whenever we talk about IELCC framework, we're actually talking about three very specific and distinct frameworks. One for First Nations, one for Inuit, and one for Métis. So when you pick up that document, you are getting three in one, if you will. Um, <clears throat> in the early childhood context, when we talk about First Nations, Inuit, and Métis self-determination, we are acknowledging that First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples are distinct peoples with rights to self-determination, including the right to control the design, delivery, and administration of an Indigenous ELCC system that reflects their unique needs, priorities, and aspirations. The overarching frame uh, vision in the I, Indigenous Early Learning and Child Care Framework focuses upon um, a number of things, but I want to point these out to you. The first is that first the vision, if you will, is for First Nations, Inuit and Métis children to be happy and safe and to have a strong cultural identity. And children are viewed in the context of family and community. 
not unto themselves, that we need to look at it much more holistically. The vision also um, focuses on a coordinated and comprehensive system of ELCC policies, programs and services led by Indigenous peoples. And that these programs and services are rooted in Indigenous knowledges, cultures and languages. The vision finally focuses on a concept of strong partnerships, knowing that we cannot do this alone, but there needs to be strong partnerships in order for at multiple levels um, in this complex um, reality. So there, that is clearly mentioned. There's also nine principles that underlie the framework. Um, the first focus is on indigenous knowledges, languages and cultures, so no surprise there. And the second recognizes the First Nations, Inuit and Métis right to self-determination. Those are critical um, and to this framework <clears throat> and to the people. So it's a very, when you think about that and the way this is written, this is a very different starting place when we compare it with other ELCC frameworks. Um, <clears throat> just want to say a couple more words um, about children. Um, the importance of children's cultural identity is at the core in this. And it is inextricably linked to children's well-being and to the building of our nations. And those are the kinds of conversations we had when we were developing this. So our children are at the core of our nations and they are its survival and ensures its continuity. That's a really important um, consideration when you consider our history and current day realities as First Nations, Inuit and Métis people in Canada. We cannot deny the colonial reality of Canada, nor the fact that First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples have been marginalized in their own lands. We cannot deny that any longer. Colonialism has always been and continues to be about power and the insistence that some have power at the expense of others. When I think about those, those are huge philosophical statements. When I think about that, and I think about the context of the COVID-19 reality that we are living right now, that this reality has shone once again a light on the persisting inequities that First Nations, Inuit and Métis people experience every day. And I don't say that just from the health sector, but if we look across all of the sectors, you can see those inequities. And certainly um, when we look at childcare, um, it is evident there as well. We have much work to do together in that area. So when you think about this kind of context, uh, I mean, we are living in extraordinary times with COVID-19, uh, the, the historical realities, all of those um, pieces. When you look at it, it actually, it, it makes complete sense that then the First Nations Inuit and Métis peoples would assert their inherent right to be self-determining over themselves, and the lives of their children. And I think that the uh, Indigenous Early Learning and Child Care Framework has given us a step in that direction. It's a step towards acknowledging and honoring First Nations, Inuit and Métis children, families and communities. And it's evident in that document. Our work then as educators, researchers, policymakers, academics, and decision makers is to prepare all of our children. I guess, and this is, gets back to my vision for a, few, uh, for a future for all of our children that is rich with diversity and free from oppression. The Miigwech. Thank you so much, Marco. Chris? Would you like to respond? Yeah, I'll be very brief, uh, Monica, because I'm just looking at the time here. And so I, I would 
um, like to thank Margot for her uh, observations. And, and I think it's become clear to, to hopefully all of us that, um, that early learning and childcare in some ways is, a, is part of a cultural slash political struggle, not partisan political, hopefully, but it's a, it's a struggle around values and ideals. And I, and I think it's become clear, certainly to the Matart Foundation and the constituents we work with, is that, that there's a moral obligation to stand, aside, stand alongside um, indigenous nations, peoples, and communities to speak to uh, their truth in respect to early learning and childcare. And, and for those of us who've been around as long as I have, I think it's really, when we look at the early learning and childcare literature, we go back to some really foundational principles. And these are the, the writings of uh, Malagusi, Freire, Dewey, and, and, and more, more recently, Peter Moss commenting on these within the context uh, of democracy, there's something that needs to be profoundly democratic about early learning and childcare, how it's organized, uh, delivered, and how individuals and families uh, participate. In that respect, democracy is, is not the choice that we see within a consumer model. Right? It, it's not consumer choice. It, it's a much richer, uh, a deeper choice. And in, in 2012, Michael Sandel wrote a book that I think is incredibly important within the context of the pandemic. And he said, the book's titled, What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets. And what Sandel speaks to is the sense that markets devalue and corrupt things by their nature. And so if we're looking at early and childcare from a standpoint of reconciliation, then we need to go back to democratizing early learning and childcare, not, not packaging it within the context of a, of a market.